There's two things that I think no matter who you are, you'll always get the heebie-jeebies upon hearing them. It's just that'll put anyone on edge. The first is if someone screams fire in a crowded space, like a movie theater or a concert venue. And the second is if you're told that a beloved video game franchise is getting adapted into a television program, which is just about as painful as getting caught in a fire. Video game adaptations are all over the place. The hits hit, and the like the Halo series, goodness gracious, what a stinky that was. It was, season one was made by people that were proud to have never touched the Halo games, so obviously the show was kind of doomed to fail from the get-go. Season two was a little bit better, albeit not great by any means, but that doesn't necessarily mean that all video game live-action series are bad. We just recently saw a good one with Last of Us, for example. So with Fallout coming out, I was kind of skeptical, but I knew there was a chance that it could be good, and the trailers looked pretty decent, but I wasn't really going to rip my shirt off and start twirling it over my head like I'm at Mardi Gras begging for beads shaking my tits. Like, there was still a chance it could end up revolting and just trash, but now that it's released, I'm happy to say that's not the case, and if you've been on the internet over the last couple days, you'll see that the reviews for this are going gushing grannies for the Fallout series, and I think it's, it's actually very good. Like, much to my and many others' pleasant surprises, I thought at best it would be decent, but it's actually pretty great, all things considered. I'll avoid spoilers here, but there's eight episodes, all of which dropped on Amazon in one big batch, so they gave you the entire payload up front, which I'm, I've been very vocal, not a huge fan of the binge model. I'd prefer it was a weekly basis, because this just means it's going to fade out of people's minds much quicker than, like, an Invincible, which is another Amazon series that they do release weekly. It keeps people talking about it, and it keeps everyone on the same pace, so you can reflect on each individual episode, speculate on where things are going, and digest it that way. I think it's a lot more fun, and it gives the series a longer runway in the public consciousness. So I think it was a bit of a fumble with just dropping it all at once, but there's people that swear by the binge model like it's a religion. Like, they are really into being able to sit down and binge eight and a half hours worth of content all at once and then talk about it for a day and be done. Which is totally fine. I'm not your dad. I'm not going to come in there and start liking your cheeks for liking. I don't. It's just I prefer the weekly model because then you get to all be at the exact same point together and you get to talk about it, and it's a little bit more fun, at least in my personal opinion, but it's not that big of a deal. It's not like it has anything to do with the actual quality of the Fallout series, but I just wanted to mention that. Anyway, Fallout is very clearly made by people that are extremely knowledgeable on the games, and I think it's I think it's obviously because they brought aboard Todd, they brought in Bethesda to work on this with them. This isn't a situation like with Halo, where they're proudly oblivious to anything that happened in the established lore, and they just make up, pull all kinds of garbage out of there and throw it onto the screen. Here, they paid close attention to the continuity of the series. They paid very close attention to all of the lore that has been established in the Fallout universe, and they tell their own story within it, for the most part, that plays by all of the established rules. And I really like that. What should be common sense to everyone in the industry is a very rare delight, it seems, where if you bring aboard the people that helped create this property you're adapting, you get a much better product, because you're adapting with the actual creators on board to help steer the ship. Mind-boggling concept, I know. Someone go ahead and tell all the other uh, dog video game adaptations that this is the chemical X to the formula you need. Bring in the actual creators. I mean, this and One Piece, like, it should be pretty obvious by this point. Yet we do still continue to get horrible adaptations in the space somehow. But, anyway, Fallout is not a horrible adaptation by any means whatsoever. So the story really feels right at home in like a Fallout game. It's very reminiscent of Fallout 3, at least in the beginning, because it's very simple to start. You follow a vault dweller named Lucy, and some bad happens, and her dad gets taken. So she leaves the vault to find her dad. And of course, it gets a lot deeper than that. Obviously, it doesn't stay simple. It's a lot more than just finding pops and getting them back home. You meet a lot of really cool characters right away, like the ghoul, who I think really is a scene stealer anytime the ghoul is on screen. And then you meet Maximus, the Brotherhood of Steel representative. And I just gotta tell you, one of the biggest compliments I can give this show is that they've nailed the aesthetic of Fallout. Every single frame of this show oozes Fallout. At no point did I ever get the impression that they're just doing some kind of bad cosplay. All of the sets, and especially the power armor, 
look phenomenal. I've seen a complaint from actual drones that are just trying their best to find things I hate about this show, saying that it's just nothing but references and that it never actually captures the ambiance of Fallout. What a bunch of hooey. Like, that... There's plenty of things you cannot like about this show. I openly admit that it's not perfect. But that is one that you are actually making up a bunch of gobbledygook for. Because this show nails the Fallout vibe. From its sets, to its costumes, to its world, to its writing, everything in this show is a slam dunk with capturing the feel of Fallout. Now, my favorite Fallout is actually Fallout 3. Even though I recognize Fallout New Vegas is the best Fallout game, probably. I don't even know why I'm saying probably. I think objectively Fallout New Vegas is the best Fallout game. It is extraordinary. And if you check my channel, some of my earliest videos that started to like get shared elsewhere were Fallout New Vegas videos I was making because I put so much time into it. But there was super special about Fallout 3 in particular that really sunk its fangs deep into my soul. Like, it captured me in a way that very few games had prior and very few games have since. Like, when that game came out, I spent that entire summer just basically doing everything possible in Fallout 3 and then some. I put so many hours into that game in one summer, it was like I was trying to train to be a pilot. I put more hours into that than pilots do into flight simulators. I was going crazy with it. But I do recognize Fallout New Vegas is the best game in the franchise, to be honest. But the reason why I'm pointing this out is because when watching the show, it's very easy to see references and little easter eggs to things directly from the game. But to say that the show is nothing but references is so stupid. Like, actually brain dead to make that as some kind of complaint. Because this show is not just relying on cameos and references and fan service. It tells a really good story. It has beautiful presentation. Its visuals are extraordinary. And we'll get into even more compliments here in a minute. But there is so much more than just referencing the games. But as someone who puts so much time into a lot of the Fallout games, there are very clear little Easter eggs and references. But that's not at all the bulk of the show whatsoever. And it's ridiculous to even try and make the claim that it is. So I just wanted to point that out. But anyway, I think this show is going to appeal to pretty much everyone, even if you don't know that it's based on games or anything. Even if you have no idea what Fallout the franchise is, if you just see this come across your Amazon, you're like, ah, I'll check it out. I think this show is going to hook you immediately. From the very beginning, the intro with the bombs dropping, breathtaking. I thought that was great. And the action is so and so gory, I was surprised. Like, I, I thought it would be pretty gory given how Fallout goes, especially with Vats and everything. But I didn't think they'd really be able to capture the feel of Vats in live action. Boy howdy, I was very wrong. The very first time the ghoul gets into his in a town where he just slaughters brutally like 20 different dudes, it is a thing of beauty. They do it masterfully with like slow-mo that doesn't feel like Zack Snyder Rebel Moon slow-mo where it's just useless and bloat. It feels so stylized. So he's got like his little his little gizmo, his little doohickey that's shooting these giant like mini nukes almost from a pistol, like a revolver. And it's like piercing people and blowing their entire spine out there. Like some, like half of someone's head gets blasted off in a collateral. And he's just like going around in circles like it's Deadeye at a Red Dead Redemption. It's so cool. They really nail the VATS system feel in live action. It was extraordinary. And I think that's going to hook anybody, even if you don't know it's supposed to be like VATS inspired. It was great. And like I said, I really do like the narrative here, and I really like the writing of the characters. None of the characters feel annoying. It doesn't feel like they're trying to just emulate some of the greatness that the game's captured with some iconic characters. It feels like they really took the writing style of what worked in the Fallout games and made believable characters in live action here out of it. I, at no point, for example, Lucy, I never felt like she was annoying or anything. She's the naive vault dweller, and now she's in the surface world, and things are super different up here, and she conducts herself in a very peculiar manner. Like in the scene I'm mentioning with the ghoul, she's like, Listen, sir, I don't know who the aggressor was, but I think we can all agree that maybe it's time you get out of here. Scram! Get out of town, or I'll be forced to use deadly force against you. That kind of thing. And it doesn't feel corny. It feels fresh. <laughs> like, it really does. However, not, this isn't necessarily in regards to character writing, but just general writing. There are so many plot conveniences that happen that you start to go, hmm, interesting. Like, it's important to take note that this is a huge world, right? Yet somehow, people are exactly where they need to be when they need to be. And they keep coincidentally just like running into each other and stumbling into the exact position they need to be in for the story to continue the way that it has. 
it, like, I get that it's a show, but at certain points it was like, come on, are you kidding me? You're telling me, like, in the middle of nowhere you were able to, to find this and, and do that? Again, I'm trying to avoid the spoilers, but even, even by episode two, I think many of you will know what I'm trying to talk about here. Maybe it's a, a stylistic choice. It's inspired by the video game's fast travel. So all the characters in the show can literally, like, Goku instant transmission exactly where they want to be immediately when they want to be there. Like, maybe, maybe it's on purpose. In fact, there was a couple moments at the end of the season that did feel like they were like, alright, come on, let's start to, let's start to finish this off here. We, we've got deadlines to meet. Let's start to really make a, a push to the finish line. Like, there are certain things, and I'm trying to avoid spoilers, that do feel like they are rushed at the end. But I don't think that really takes away from the overall experience of the season either. It wasn't that detrimental, but it was a little sad to see that it did seem like it was trying to hurry itself along. But... I don't have any major complaints about like the overall narrative of the show, however I did decide to look into those that do because there were a lot of people that were very vocal about how much they hated the direction the narrative went, which was a little surprising to me. And for the most part what I'm seeing is people didn't like how it handled the New Vegas element of the show. This show fits in the Fallout universe, like I said, so New Vegas, it's, I'm not, I'm trying, I'm really trying to avoid spoilers, but New Vegas. It's here in, in a certain capacity. And a lot of people thought that the show was kind of spitting on it to a certain degree and kind of just like writing New Vegas off or not really paying respect to what New Vegas canon like uh, solidified to a certain degree. And I just have to disagree. Like I really feel like the show, if it continues, is actually going to put a pretty big emphasis on that going, but at least that's the impression I get. Like I don't, I didn't really get what a lot of people are saying about how New Vegas was handled here as being a negative thing. At least not yet. I guess we'd have to see where the show goes going. But right now, I just really don't think they did anything wrong with it. At least nothing that would make me upset. And th this is coming from someone who does love New Vegas the game. So, I really don't think they made any bad decisions with the lore. Now, of course, I'm not like a lore expert in Fallout or anything. So maybe there are certain things like little tidbits that they messed around with. I saw a lot of people mentioning things about the NCR and how they didn't really handle the NCR properly in regards to their presence in the games and where they should be in the year that this takes place. And I guess that could be a very valid complaint because, again, I'm not entirely sure on the, like, the, the specifics of the timeline of the games and where everything fits. But for the show... Everything really does work, and I feel like they're not backed into a corner where they can't fix certain things that might be a little out of whack with the timeline going. I feel like there's a lot of flexibility going with it if it continues. But actually, you know, there is one narrative choice that they made that I didn't really like that much. I wasn't exactly pumping my fist when it came to a certain twist that they put out there that I'd never really seen present in any of the Fallout games, but maybe I'm just some kind of stupid Neanderthal that slept walk through it. But... This is going to be a minor spoiler. I'm not going to give, like, big spoilers, but it has to do with in regards to Vault Tech. And and there's a certain angle that they hint at, play at, and go down in the show that doesn't really make sense to me given the state of the world of Fallout. Like, to me, it just doesn't work all that well unless there's, unless there's like, some kind of bigger galaxy brain scheme that I can't quite figure out. But when it comes to the world ending, I feel most organizations would probably look at that as a net loss because then you can't really control as many people, you can't make as much money, you really lose a lot when the entire world ends. It, it really wouldn't be the end-all be-all goal for pretty much any company, I would think. But anyway, I feel like I'm already giving away a little too much when it comes to that, that section there. But I did want to point that out because I didn't like that all that much. Maybe it'll be a bit deeper down the line, but for now I just thought that was a little a little silly. But overall I do think the show is pretty extraordinary. This is another one of those video game adaptation bangers where they actually had a team that was about it, a team that was knowledgeable on it, and delivered great. So if I was to give Fallout a score on the moist meter, I'd probably like that puppy with a cool 90%. Like I really do think this is a show worth watching even if you're not familiar with the Fallout games or the universe at all. I still think this is a show you're going to enjoy. It's hard not to like it, to be honest. No matter <laughs> what familiarity you have with the property, it's just a really cool show that's really well done. So yeah, that's really about it. So yeah. For a couple months now, so many of you have been asking me if I'm going to be making a moist meter on Jujutsu Kaisen Season 2, and I've always proudly proclaimed, yes, of course I'll be making a moist meter for it. You bet your sweet bippy. But, unfortunately... Just like Fire Festival, 
I lied. I'm a big fat liar and Frankie Munez ain't the one exposing me. I'm doing it myself. I pulled your leg, I yanked your chain, and I'm not sorry. I'm not making a moist meter. I'm making this video. I'm just gonna sit here and gushing grannies over Jujutsu Kaisen Season 2 because I, no exaggeration, believe it is a masterpiece of action shonen. I know the word masterpiece gets tossed around willy-nilly. It, it's used very loosey-goosey. It's pretty much lost most of its meaning. It's like the word prank to a YouTuber. Masterpiece doesn't hold the same weight that it used to, but I'm using it in the truest sense of the word. I 100% with my, my whole heart believe that season 2 of Jujutsu Kaisen is legitimately a masterpiece in animation and action for that matter. Now, before really getting into this, I want to make it clear that I'm not ignorant to the problems at MAPPA. Uh, MAPPA is the studio that produces Jujutsu Kaisen anime, and they have been overworking their staff, and it is a tragic situation at the actual MAPPA headquarters, because the work they have produced here is spectacular, but it came at the cost of the health of its employees, and I think that is completely unacceptable. All I can do is hope that MAPPA improves its infrastructure so that way it actually takes care of the talent that makes this possible. It is clear that so much went into this season, it oozes out of every frame of this show. It is unbelievable what they were able to do with Season 2 of Jujutsu Kaisen. I didn't think they'd even come close to matching the beauty of Season 1 of Jujutsu Kaisen, and somehow they came in here and its cheeks red. This is so much better somehow. It, like, it, it is mind-boggling just how good Season 2 is when it comes to its action. So, let me dive into this. I think, and I said this for Jujutsu Kaisen Season 1, that this is the best pure action that anime has to offer, period. This is about the best it can get in, in that genre. I, I don't think there's anything else that really competes with it in terms of what they're able to capture in the anime. Now... That being said, I do understand that a lot of people have complaints about its story and its power scaling, as well as some of its characters not ever really being developed and sometimes just used to, like, shock and, like, startle viewers. And I do get those complaints. Like, I definitely do feel that in Season 2 here. They introduce some really cool characters, only, like, quickly just pull them off. Or even off a character that never really had a chance to really be fully explored and be fully fleshed out, even though there were all signs pointing to that being the case. So it feels like at points, the narrative was there just to subvert your expectations for the sake of it, which felt a little unsatisfying to see a character's story come to a close the way that it did a couple times. Though, other times, it really felt like, damn, this is a big important moment, and it does feel like they were sent out in a really fitting way. So it was a couple hits and a couple misses when it came to that, but overall it didn't detract from my enjoyment of the story or the show as well. I actually love the universe of Jujutsu Kaisen and I love the characters. Toto is still my favorite character, and even though he's not as prominent in this season as he was in season one, when he's here, he shines. He shines bright like a diamond. I love Toto. And even characters that I didn't really care for in season one have really great moments and even like small arcs in season two like Mechamaru. And it even explores the villain side of things and makes you somewhat sympathetic to a couple of them like Jogo for example who is kind of a joke but Jogo is really interesting because he only squares off against the strongest possible opponents so we never really get to see him display his power against people less than godlike and nearly unbeatable. In season two we do get to see him like flex like, we get to see him go crazy on some sorcerers that aren't necessarily unbeatable deities. And damn, he is strong. He is spitting it on people. Season 2 is really like this avalanche of hype. It starts with just this absolute snowball rolling down the hill of hype, adrenaline, incredible action, and it's all beautiful to watch, and it never stops. It just keeps gaining speed, gaining girth, gaining... It's just this non-stop runaway train of beauty and i loved every second of the ride i, I don't want to get into anything spoilery here i i really do just want to sing its praises because i think what's been produced is extremely special now there are plenty of valid complaints like about what not to like about jujutsu kaisen when it comes to story and characters and whatever but there is no real complaint that can be made that its action or its animation is anything less than top tier and some of the best the industry has ever seen full stop 
that there if there's anyone saying otherwise they're being contrarian for the sake of it or trying to get like engagement bait because it, it is objectively legitimately objectively speaking some of the most beautiful most dynamic action that anime has right now and it's kept up through the entire season it's not just a couple tiddlywinks sprinkled throughout major episodes and major narrative moments it's every episode every fight has so much tender loving care put into every goddamn frame that it creates this beautiful piece every fight every moment of a fight is amazing and it's not just like a couple of big moves that are animated really well they have so much hand-to-hand -hand combat with like a dynamic moving camera that follows the action around and it never really gets disorienting except for a couple of moments during fights where things just go absolutely chaotic like legitimately bonkers but other than that it's all extremely easy to understand what's happening and so fun to watch I really think Jujutsu Kaisen Season 2 is perhaps the best action shonen that can be made. Like, I don't know how you can do action in anime better than this season just did. Like, I, I feel like we've just now been spoiled for the rest of the humanity's existence on this space rock with the best possible action anime we, we will ever see. Which is cool, you know, what a time to be alive. But damn, like, where do you go from here? I don't... I. I don't think it can be topped. I really don't. I can't recommend this show enough. I think even if you hate anime, if you hate animation, you will still probably find a lot of enjoyment watching the action here. Because Jesus Christ, it is a spectacle. So yeah, I just wanted to make this. I know I didn't really get into the nitty gritty on any of it because I, I just don't even need to. This season is very simple. Bad thing happens. Very creative plan from the bad guys goes exactly how they want it to mainly and now it's a series of fights to try and overpower them and you're just getting fight after fight after fight after fight after fight i think every single episode in this season had a big fight in it or was a continuation of a big fight that had happened in the episode before and how can you not love that how can you not love that yes you can want more narratively i get it but jesus christ this is still such a beautiful meal to be consumed here i loved it I think it is a must watch. I'm a huge fan. Clearly I'm sitting here, you know, going wild over it like a kid on Christmas that just got that bike they've been wanting for so long. But like this is an anime wet dream of a production and it is just still such a shame that MAPPA overworks and mistreats its employees. I need to mention that again because the talent behind this deserves to have their flowers here. Like what they have done is unbelievable and they should be for that. Not with like pain and misery while working at MAPPA and dreading every single day. I remember I re uh, read on Twitter how during one of the major fights in the episode, they had actually slid in the MAPPA headquarters building and it gets like blown to pieces. I don't know if that was just a meme or if that's true, but I do believe it because a lot of animators came to talk about their awful experience while working on this because of the way MAPPA oversees the project. And that, because this, what they've made is incredible and this talent deserves to be. So amazing season. Amazing show, amazing series. I'm trying so hard not to read the manga because I want to just experience it in its animated format. But man, it is tough to fight that urge. Anyway, highly recommend. That's about it. See ya. I see a lot of atrocious movies in the movie theater. I do it on purpose. I, I excitedly go there, enthusiastically pumping my fist at the newest pile of garbage that I'll be watching. And I know they're going to be horrible going into them. But I still do it because I find a sick pleasure in it. I'm pretty sure I'm the exact demographic they're marketing these revolting, stinky piles of dog to. And I don't mind eating it with a smile on my face most of the time because I enjoy making fun of them. But sometimes, I see good movies too. And that's the case with today. I saw A Quiet Place Day 1. I liked the previous two Quiet Place movies, so I had high expectations for this one, and I'm happy to say they were met. I expected it to be good. It was good. Case closed. Let's go into why it was good. It does what I think the other two movies did very well, which is really sell you on intense situations. So you already know the shtick of this series by now, where there's these monsters that are on the planet now, the world has fundamentally ended for the most part, there's still pockets of humanity left, and they can't make a peep. They can't so much as fart without a monster jumping on them, mauling them, tearing them, tearing them to pieces. So it's always high stakes whenever a sound is made, and they have to do their best to not squeak out any any decibels and i think that leads to some really creative scenes and quiet place day one has many such situations 
So this is, as the name would imply, the very first day that the monsters hit the planet. They come in on these asteroids, they, and then all of these monsters start all over the city. They got these long arms looking like Slender Man. They just start people who start screaming, and we follow a character who's smack dab in the middle of it with her trusty sidekick, an adorable cat. The main character has cancer, and she's been in hospice nearing the end of her life, and all of this starts happening. So she is with her cat tackling these very tense situations and meets someone else who really tags along with her and they grow a great connection and have great chemistry together. His name is Eric. Now I, I'm trying to avoid spoilers here for the most part but since the main character has been dealing with cancer and is already nearing the end of her life she wants to spend her final moments trying to basically recapture the magic of what she remembered from her childhood so she wants a piece of pizza from a very special place in her heart and her and Eric and her cat then engage in this mission this quest to go get that piece of pizza and that's all I'll say about the story without getting into spoilers it's a really beautifully told narrative honestly I, I was very surprised with just how much I ended up caring about all of the characters and I think that really helped is the cat. Now you could argue that it's kind of cheap to use animals to elicit an emotional response from these because everybody loves seeing a cat or a dog on screen and they're always constantly on the edge of their seat wondering, praying, hoping that nothing bad happens to the animal. But in this movie it didn't feel like it was used as some kind of cheap gimmick. It actually felt like it contributed a lot to the overall plot and just kind of like the theme of the movie. But I do have a bit of a complaint about that because the cat is unrealistic. It's not, it, that cat's not real. That, it's got to be like an animatronic. Or, I, I have a cat, Io, and she would not act like this cat. So in a world where you can't make a noise, Io would be screaming and shouting all the time just out of spite. So in the film, she's traveling with her cat and then sometimes like a sound will get made and then all of a sudden the monster immediately shows up. Like they just instant transmission like Goku to get there. So then the monster's there and they have to just shut down all sound and that leads to her really tightly gripping that cat. And the cat doesn't make a noise. Nothing. That, that's not how cats act, in, in my experience. If I did that to Io, th the monster wouldn't even have a chance to kill me. Io would rip my heart out. She would be hissing and shouting and just clawing me to pieces. I would just be like instigated, like it's Team Fortress 2, and the monster would probably be afraid of my cat. Like, th like I don't think the cat uh, was acting like a real cat would being like gripped like that even taken underwater at certain times and still not making a sound when brought back out of water so this cat's got some kind of superpowers or maybe it's extremely smart and it immediately understands that the monsters hunt by sound so it knows not to make sound and in that case it's an extremely smart cat but anyway that was one of those things where i was like oh there's no way there's no way and also the cat is kind of omniscient so there's a couple times where the cat runs away like really runs away and then within a couple of finds its way back to not only the main character but Eric it, like it, the cat just knows where everyone is at all times it has like an unlimited UAV from Call of Duty and can just immediately find the people that it needs to find with no problem but you know it's a, it's a movie I, I get it it's not supposed to be like extremely realistic but it's just one of those things that really stood out to me aside from some of that with the cat though i really think the movie is just very well done i, I really enjoyed it it's not like a horror movie or anything so i, I don't know if anyone has that perception going into it because some of the marketing material makes it seem like it's supposed to be it's really not it's much more of just like a thriller movie where you know there's high stakes it's intense but it's not scary per se Unless you really find the monster design off-putting, which it's supposed to be, so that's totally fine. But I would never... This is like a horror film, to be honest. Not that it needs to be. I think it excels at what it aims to do. I really thought it did a great job of telling an extremely emotional story and telling it really, really well. There was a lot of great action sequences that took place. There is a couple of times where I had the question how the, the monsters could hear one thing but not the other. Like, there's a couple scenes where someone's breathing right in the face of the monster... And, like, other times, they can hear the sound of, like, a Coke can being gently pushed by a light breeze from across the entire city, but not the breathing in their face. So, it's just, you know, it's not a big deal. You know, it's not the biggest deal in the world. But I just wanted to point that out, because sometimes it felt like they couldn't hear things when it was just convenient to not hear them. And, and though, I guess in a couple of those scenes, they were distracted to put an argument 
against myself here. Overall, though, I really liked the movie. I thought it was very good. Uh, I've got no real complaints about it, like nothing serious about it that, that I could complain about and say I didn't like. So yeah, plugging this into the moist meter, I think I'll give it like a comfortable 85-ish percent. I think it's a, a great watch. I, I think if you've liked the previous two Quiet Place movies, you'll probably like this one. I don't think it like does anything crazy that the genre hasn't explored before, but everything it does, it does well, and you get kind of what you're expecting from the Quiet Place universe, which I'm always pretty pleased with. So yeah, that's about it. Yeah. Nope, quick fake out. I actually just remembered one other thing I want to mention. Uh, when coming into this movie, I thought it was going to explain like how the world fell to the monsters because one of my big complaints about the first Quiet Place, and it's not, I'm using the word complaint really loosey-goosey here, but one of my nitpicks on the first movie was how do you actually fight against the monsters and what they discover is I feel like humanity would have immediately discovered the second that these creatures showed up and they realized they could hunt by sound. I thought this movie would explain how they were ineffective at beating the monsters, but it doesn't really explore that. However, the film does immediately showcase that people were quick to pick up that the mon monsters hunt by sound. So the second they arrive, they start everyone, the main character gets knocked out from an explosion. When she comes to, within like the next scene or two, there's helicopters that fly overhead with megaphones telling people, don't make a sound. Don't make noise. Like, be as quiet as you can possibly be, you know, silence is golden type thing. So, the military, at least, immediately recognized that it's sound. Like, that's how they hunt. It's purely based on sound. So the weapon from the first movie, like the technique from the first movie, I feel like the military would have immediately started to theorize on, yet I guess they never did for some reason. I'm trying not to spoil what that weapon is in case you haven't seen the Quiet Place movies, but it's pretty much exactly you, what you would expect it to be if it was a creature that hunts by really intense hearing. How are you going to fight back against that? I think the answer to a lot of people will probably be obvious and ring a bell right away. So this movie doesn't really explore how the world falls. It's more so a very personal story between two, well, three characters, including the cat, and their journey together through this perilous situation. And I think that's great. I think they do a wonderful job with it. I did want to mention that, though. So that's really about it. So yeah. What do the two best movies of the year have in common? Sand. Dune 2 and now Furiosa. I don't know why sand seems to be the, the new thing for high quality productions, but God bless. Furiosa is extraordinary. I am a huge fan of Mad Max Fury Road. I think it is a masterpiece that will probably forever stand the test of time. I think that movie will always be good even a hundred years from now, no matter what the standards are then. When our existence is just like little brains in a jar, we'll probably still be highly entertained by Mad Max Fury Road. So to say Furiosa had big shoes to fill in my eyes is an understatement, and I'm happy to say that I think it absolutely succeeded here. Now, I'll go ahead and get this out of the way right now, we'll get down to the tax. It's not better than Fury Road, but I would say it's almost as good as Fury Road in a very different way. These are totally different experiences. Fury Road is a spectacle that's a little light on characters because it didn't really need to. You just get so lost in this unbelievable experience that you don't really need a lot of depth to the world and the characters around it. Furiosa, however, is all about its characters and world building. While of course maining that iconic DNA that Mad Max has become known for of beautiful action set pieces, practical effects, combustion engines that rattle your testicles in your seat, pumping gasoline into your veins as you watch the film, pumping your fist at the set pieces, all of that is still very much intact, and it now has a much deeper lore-rich world and characters to accompany it. So, let's get into it. This obviously focuses on the origin story of Furiosa taking place before Fury Road, kind of explaining how she got to where she is in that film. It starts with her as a child getting kidnapped by the new main villain here, Dementis, played by Chris Hemsworth. I love the name Dementis, by the way. It's very reminiscent of old George Lucas Sith Lord ideas with Darth Insanius and Darth Yucky. I love that name. Dementis is so good. Now, I initially thought he'd be like a great value of Morton Joe, but he's not at all, just completely different. It's like comparing me to a tall person, like it's not even on the same scale. The only thing that a Morton Joe and Dementis share in common is that they're both worshipped by their followers. But Dementis is completely unhinged while also being extremely crafty, and it's very clear that Chris Hemsworth loved 
playing this role. Every time he is on screen, it just seems like I'm watching him like have the time of his life. I'm not kidding when I say I half expected him to bust out some of my dog dance moves when he was going into like a villain speech that he was given. I thought he'd be hitting him with like the where's my hug at when he's threatening a Morton Joe or like he is just it's hard not to be entertained when Dementis is on screen. I'm trying not to get into any like spoilers or anything, but I love the way that he approaches this world. He knows that he is a piece of, he's well aware of it, and he just tries to have fun with that. Not, I'm talking about Dementis the character now, not just Chris Hemsworth playing him. So like, for example, when he goes to try and strike a deal with a Morton Joe, he has a hostage. And he has this, this weapon that's attached to the hostage that he's like holding back, and he's got little nipple clamps attached to it at the same time, so that way if he lets go, it's gonna rip his nipples off. For no reason other than he likes having his nipples clamped and thought it'd be fun. Like, I, I don't know, like, how can you not enjoy that? That's so good. So, I am a huge fan of Dementis, and I am glad that it's not just doing the Immortan Joe character again. They made a completely unique one here with Dementis, and I think they crushed it, and Chris Hemsworth nailed the performance of it. And I also think Anya Taylor-Joy did an amazing job as a young Furiosa here. She doesn't have very many lines, but the lines she does have are very powerful. When she uses her voice, it is a big deal, and it carries a lot of weight. She's also extremely, so she's like a one-woman army, just like slaughtering tons and tons of people, but she's so far from invincible. She gets beat up, she loses more than she wins, she, well, try not to get into spoilers, but she suffers great loss, like, physically, emotionally, obviously, like, she is not, you know, some superhero, but she does what she needs to to survive, and she is great at that. But anyway, switching gears back to the overall story, the narrative. After kidnapping Furiosa, Dementis does Unforgivable, and Furiosa dedicates her life to revenge. She will do anything she can to get the chance at Dementis for what he has done. And it's a really, really good revenge movie. I have no complaints at all about the characters or the writing. I do, however, have like a bit of a nitpick with a couple of things that happen in the story, but they're not a big deal. It's not an overall detriment. But there was a couple moments where I really thought it didn't make sense that the people around Furiosa wouldn't have taken notice of a couple things that she had done. It's not that big of a deal that they didn't. You can kind of just write that off as like, Everyone here is kind of out of their mind. They're off their gourd. They're literally cl like chroming their face and like everyone's very, you know, in a different mindset. So maybe they just wouldn't notice or they wouldn't, you know, recognize faces or pick up on certain things. So now let's get into that I'm sure everybody wants to hear about the action. Mad Max Fury Road became very, very well known for its practical effects using all real stuff, stunts, actors, cars, vehicles, you know, all of the explosions, all of it being very authentic, very little CGI. There is CGI in the movie, contrary to popular belief, there is CGI in Fury Road, but it's used to enhance a lot of the practical effects to make them even larger than life, and it never really feels like there's CGI there when it is there. Furiosa does have more CGI. And Furiosa's CGI isn't used in the same way it was in Fury Road. What I mean by that is there's a couple of scenes that it's very clear they're in front of a green screen. It is still majority practical effects. Like, don't mistake me, this isn't like a Marvel movie level, you know, CGI out the wazoo or anything here. But there is noticeably more here and it does stand out, especially because I went in expecting there to be pretty much none. Like there was in Fury Road where it's, you know, it's sprinkled in here and there for some flavor. But in Furiosa, there are entire sequences that definitely have a lot of CGI elements to them. It's not horrible CGI or anything. We're not talking like it's Beast from the 90s or anything. You know, it's not looking like Jimmy Neutron. But you just do notice them because everything else is practical effects for most of the scenes. So when there are scenes that are a lot of green screen, you're like, huh, that looks super different than what I just saw. What kind of fishy business is afoot here? Now, I understand it's a much bigger movie in terms of, like, scale than Fury Road, so it's hard to expect all of it to be practical, but it is definitely worth noting that there are some scenes here where it does stand out. Like, I hate to just keep comparing it to Fury Road, but it's super hard not to. So, like, when you have the big, when you had the big CGI moments in Fury Road, like the storm, 
that still looked like amazing like that looked so like vivid like it really felt powerful like that cgi was there to enhance and bring more flavor to everything we were experiencing like physically like all the practical effects the cgi here it doesn't really do the same thing and i, and I know i already mentioned that but i wanted to give like a direct example like with the, the storm and fury road but overall i was still very pleased and highly entertained by all of the action sequences it is so incredible to see like <laughs> the boys jumping down slamming the explosive sticks throwing the explosive sticks and they had like the some paramotors going and dropping more explosives on the rig like it was all so good so good and one thing that i have to mention here is i just love the world like i love all of like the the silly character costumes that george miller comes up with they're so good there's just nothing else really like it it's just so unique i i'm a huge fan and i really do think furiosa is a great film i don't have any like major complaints like even the cgi thing that i harped on a little bit to me didn't ruin it it didn't take me out of it it wasn't even like really disappointing or anything per se it's just that i noticed where i was like oh fury road i do think was definitely better in that regard but furiosa is still better than the vast majority of things that come out in terms of its action and its practical effects usage as opposed to putting all of the the budget all their eggs in the basket of cgi they say it will do it live we're going to do it with real actors real stunts real environments real vehicles run it and it's still so thrilling and it just breathes so much life into a film like this so Furiosa, I definitely think, is a must-watch movie, especially if you like Mad Max Fury Road. I imagine you probably didn't need my seal of approval on that. If you liked Fury Road, I guarantee you are going to see this no matter what. But plugging Furiosa into the moist meter, I'd easily give this a 90%. It's, it's still a very, very, very good movie. It's about two and a half hours long, and it tells like five chapters. And I don't think it feels two and a half hours long. Like, this was a, like, full throttle, you know, just blast. It was great. So, yeah, uh, Furiosa, absolute banger. It's, it's about it. So, yeah. House of the Dragon just ended, and, well, uh, House of the Dragon Season 2 just ended, not the entire series. That would be pretty crazy if it actually was the end of the series here, because all of the season was basically set up for the next season. So if they just pulled the plug on it now and be like, hey, you know what? That's where that's where this rodeo stops. That would be pretty interesting. But uh, I don't think that's going to be the case. I, I bet season three is already confirmed and I'm just not in the loop on it. Anyway, though, time to power on the fryers to serve up that yappy meal off the menu here to give you my thoughts on season two of House of the Dragon. Most of you know I really liked season one. I was stunned by how much I like season one, actually, considering how hard Game of Thrones fumbled with season eight. And also season, season seven was lackluster too, but season eight was... That was an affront to God. That was... So, like, I, I go on and on about this all the time. Game of Thrones was the biggest show in the world, and then they turned it to the biggest in the world with season eight. I use this reference a lot. Breaking Bad wrapped up years before Game of Thrones did, and yet Breaking Bad is still talked about fondly and referenced to this day. Meanwhile, Game of Thrones is just like this sad thought that people occasionally remember as, Oh yeah, what a shame. So, I didn't go into House of the Dragon Season 1 with high expectations, but I was pleasantly surprised with how good it was. And Season 2, I had high hopes for, considering how much I liked Season 1. And now, after finishing the finale, I can comfortably say it's not as good as Season 1, unfortunately. I didn't hate it or anything, like, I don't think it's bad, but it really does feel like this season is just set up for the next season. There are some, like, moments of greatness, though. Like, episode 4, I actually thought was a super, super strong episode. That's the one that you saw a lot of people talking about. I'm not gonna get into spoilers for this, so don't worry. But there definitely were some great moments in season 2. But overall, it kind of just felt like it was sleepwalking sometimes. For example, Damon. Damon basically does all in season 2. This guy has basically just been binged as, like, this you know, sidelined character that you tune in occasionally for him going through this perpetual bath salt trance. So he's in Heron Hall for the vast majority of this season. And it was always this back and forth of, is he going to betray Rhaenyra? Like, what are his actual intentions? Oh, he wants it for himself. He's always coveted the crown, this and that. But it's so boring. So he's in Heron Hall, 
And he basically hallucinates every single night. So he just like walks around in a stupor seeing things and he's like, oh, this is fishy. This is odd. So he'll be having these meetings with people, but he's like only half there because he's imagining other things. And then there's a woman there who he keeps calling a witch. And basically every time you see Damon, it's him gathering an army, but kind of just like floundering his way through it because he's mainly just like hallucinating more or less like and see like the the final episode of the season like there is a good resolution to all of that but it doesn't change how boring it was getting to that because he really is just like off in like the loony bin of heron hall to himself like he's just like institutionalized over there and people reference him like rainier is like well i don't know damon's intentions so i'm just gonna proceed as if he doesn't exist and for all intents and purposes he kind of just doesn't exist in the main story he's like off on his own thing, his own little, you know, adventure there. So it's stuff like that where it just feels so underwhelming. Like, it's clearly setting up for big for Damon here, obviously, I get that. But it doesn't make it satisfying because when the finale rolls around, it doesn't really feel satisfying because we haven't really seen him do much of anything. There was like one or two cool moments in Heron Hall. But they don't really lead to anything because, again, this season is just set up for the following seasons. So it's just, I don't know, it's just not very satisfying. And, and to piggyback off of that, a lot of the other things are just putting pieces in place. So that's really cool is how they get more dragon riders. I don't want to spoil anything, but there are more dragon riders that come into the fold here in a way that's never been explored before in lore and on screen. And it's really cool. The way that a dragon chooses a rider, where if it doesn't like you, it just incinerates you. It just sends you straight to the Shadow Realm. And it's a really tense scene. It's a great scene. It's hype. But we don't see anything from that past that point in this season. We will in the next season. And it was cool for that episode. But then in the following episode, there's nothing from it. You know what I mean? It's just, I get how important setting things up is. But it still feels lackluster by the time the finale rolls around because it's all about putting the pieces on the board getting them where they need to be for the next season which i imagine will be kind of just all out pandemonium would be my guess another thing i really didn't like is this season is starting to suffer from the same thing i said about game of thrones season 7 where all of a sudden everyone has unlocked fast travel on the map where in game of thrones in the early seasons it would be like an entire season of marching before they reached their destination. Like, there was a sense of time which increased the sense of scale in the world. In here, the characters can once again kind of just, like, Goku instant transmission where they need to be. So, Rhaenyra can go talk to Alicent. Kind of whenever she wants, like, no trouble at all. It seemed like a really easy procedure. And keep in mind, she is public enemy number one. And with a very... Simple disguise, she just infiltrates the most secure place in the world there and talks to Alicent no problem whatsoever. And then Alicent does the same to Rhaenyra. No problem whatsoever. And nobody notices, no one's none the wiser. Like, it's so quick and it seems so easy to travel between places. Another example, there is a knight who is sent from, uh, you know, Team Aegon. And the knight easily infiltrates Rhaenyra's castle. Like, it's just, it happens so quick. There's no sense of, like, danger with going from place to place. It just seems like, like, all of the security is the worst in the world. Like, they all just have their eyes closed. Through. So, it just takes away from, like, the actual high stakes. It, it, like, in my opinion, if it's that easy to go from point A to point B without any trouble. You know what I mean? Another thing that I also didn't like all that much, left a bit of a sour taste in my mouth, is how easy it seems to make alliances. It seems like anybody can make an alliance with the most elusive people ev ever, willy-nilly. Like, it just seems like no matter how bad the blood, they can easily form an alliance through just meeting, like, the most... I don't want to say, like, easiest mutual agreement, because they're not, like, easy per se, but it seems far simpler than I would have ever expected it to be. And I'm talking alliances. Like, there are some big alliances that form, and it really seemed like it was just one conversation and one loaf of bread away from happening. <laughs> like, and that's it. Like, they wasn't needing to be, like, some kind of big gesture or anything. They just had to say, like, hey, do you want to, like, team up? And then they fist bump and everything's, like, all good. 
I do, however, really like Amond in this season. I think Amond is probably the strongest character here, and not because he has a lot to do. Like, he's, it's not like the writing around Amon was, like, incredible or anything, but he's just at least interesting. He is just this, like, man-child leader who is just constantly in this fit of rage, in this desire to prove how powerful he is with Vigar. And at the very least, that drives things. Like, he himself is, like, the driving force be behind things happening, whereas every other character feels like they're just stagnant. He is pushing things, if that makes sense. I'm trying to avoid spoilers to the best of my ability, so I can't, like, get super specific with what I mean by that. But, for example, what happens to Aegon, that has a huge impact on everything, is mainly because of Aemond. So, it's just one of those things where I think Aemond was pretty much the only character this season that was actively taking matters into their own hands and doing it. Whereas everyone else was more conniving and setting things up. Which I didn't expect from the season, because season 1 ended with Rhaenyra's son being by Aemond on Vigar, Where Vigar just annihilates her son and the dragon. And then she like stares into the camera and like, I was like, holy, I was shocked by how that season ended. And I thought this season would be everything popping off. But then it actually pumps the brakes hard. And it is slow, which is fine if it's like really well written, but it only sometimes is. Like I said, there are moments where it's super solid, but then there's moments where it's just kind of in this like dull limbo, where it just feels like nothing is really happening. For example, Rhaenyra this season spends most of it in a state of reacting to information as opposed to doing stuff. Like, she is constantly in this, like, turmoil where she wants to be more active, but everyone tells her not to. So then it leads to her just staying in the castle mostly, and then responding to stuff that's going on occasionally. And sometimes she does go on her own, and that's when things get moved. Sometimes, like, when she rides on her dragon to meet a mysterious dragon rider. And then that leads to a, a plan that... Nobody's nobody ever thought of before, which was cool. And I would have liked to see more things like that. It's just, the season doesn't feel satisfying, because now that the finales come out, we know that all it is is build-up. Like, if this season wasn't over yet, like, if there were more episodes to come, it'd be pretty hype with the position that things are in. But because it's the finale, and it's going to be a long time before it's picked up again... It's just left with kind of like this, huh, okay, I guess, kind of sensation. Because you go through these eight episodes, and fundamentally we're in a very similar spot as we were to the beginning of the season, where we know is inevitable. We know is coming. The only thing that's changed now is some of the pieces on the board, and the power behind those pieces. And that just doesn't feel like really great television, where you just watched an entire season of build-up without any kind of payoff at the end. But I don't think it's bad. Like, there were things I enjoyed about it. I, I really would like to talk more about the dragon scenes in particular, but I don't want to ruin it for anyone, so I'll refrain. But I really like that they interjected, injected more personality into the dragons. Like, I actually got a good sense of the dragons through the writers and how they responded to some of the writers. Which was cool. That was that was pretty cool. There were things I liked about this season, but overall, I think it was a pretty weak season, especially compared to how great season one was. If I was to plug it into the moist meter, I'd give it like a 65% maybe, like that. But uh, yeah, hopefully season three is a, a banger. I, I hope it can be more like season one and less like season two. And uh, yeah, that's really about it. See ya. The Boys Season 4 finale just dropped, and I just watched it with these peepers of mine, so I'm here to vomit some thoughts on the season as a Throughout the season, I've been pretty vocal that, for the most part, I found it to be the weakest of the series so far. But with a series like The Boys being the weakest in this show is like being the least strong power lifter. Like, you're still stronger than 99% of the population. I still think The Boys is a really good show, better than a lot of shows that come out. I just, for the most part, felt this season 
wasn't nearly as great as the previous ones. Now before you bare your fangs at me, let me explain. Previous seasons weren't perfect or anything, they definitely had some ups and downs, but overall I just felt like it was still stronger than the majority of this season. I think the finale of season 4 was spectacular, like I actually thought that was extremely hype and it's got me salivating for the final season, but I'm going to talk about that separately. I want to talk about all the episodes leading up to it because I really felt like most of it was like watching filler in Naruto, where it was kind of like padding until the next major arc happened. Which really isn't fair to say, because this isn't like some kind of non-canon mumbo-jumbo nonsense that doesn't tie in. It wasn't just filler, it was just in a state of perpetually building to where the finale eventually takes us. But in the process of building, it kind of lost that sense of danger. Like, there was never any moments in the series, or in, sorry, in season four, where any of the main cast felt like they were in a perilous situation where someone might, or there might be like real repercussions for a decision that was made or a plan that goes wrong when it hits the fan. Now, there's no way to really talk about this without getting into some spoilers, so fair, but I'm gonna do my best to avoid like big spoilers. So what I mean by this is like, Butcher is afflicted with super cancer, the dude is fading away like a fart into the wind, and yet it still never felt like he was actually in danger of dying. And even when plans go so wrong, completely tits up, none of the characters were ever really in mortal danger. Like, it always fell onto someone else, like, who's the leak? And then eventually it ends with Web Weaver getting bisected after he comes out of his butt like six times in fear. Like, they, it just never really felt like there was any huge risk to the cast, where previous seasons doing anything directly with the soups was life or like this is a big deal but here it's played off almost comedically every single time with Huey going undercover in Web Weaver's garb and then getting for like 10 and they play it off as a joke where he gets butt ass naked and is forced to sit on top of a cake and lit in order to pleasure a complete freak superhero. So that's probably like the main reason I felt like this season was weaker than the previous ones is just because it felt like it almost never really mattered if plans went according to how they were drawn up in the blueprints, you know, whether or not you followed John Madden's playbook here, it ultimately didn't matter because the main characters had plot armor for the most part. So, it's not like the biggest deal in the world because it's still a good show. And they did some things that I really did like, especially with A-Train. I think A-Train had an incredible arc in this season and I'm really excited to see what he does in the final season. Like, they had A-Train go from this almost irredeemable character from the beginning. In fact, A-Train is really kind of the character that kicks off the boys and pretty much brings all of it to the forefront. And they take this villain and they've slowly developed him into a character that is really well fleshed out. It's a character who, for the first time in their life now, has done that made them feel like a real hero as opposed to just this Vought mascot that they pretend is a hero but is actually just like an awful person. Now, he's really feeling like he can do good. And it's really cool to see that development. Like, I really think they did amazing with A-Train and his redemption arc. And they also introduced a new character that I think is really good, Sister Sage. She's the smartest person in the world and Homelander recruits her to the Seven because he believes that she can help him accomplish all of his goals and wildest dreams. And she can. She's kind of the puppet master behind everything that happens in season four. She puts together the plan, and even when things don't go exactly how she drew it up, ultimately, things are going exactly how she wants them to, because she is that smart, and she's able to put all of these moving pieces together and just play the game. I also really love what they did with Huey's dad. I'm going to avoid spoilers around that topic, but I absolutely thought they crushed everything about that episode like it it was more than just the Huey mother and father relationship dynamic and everything there but also some of what happened there ties into just an overarching theme of it and I thought it was just like beautifully weaved into that I, I really thought they handled that super well I thought that was fantastic and of course yes Homelander is still an incredible villain and in this season even more so he doesn't exert his strength as much in this season as previous ones, but that almost makes him even more intimidating because now he's trying different besides just brute strength to get to his goals. That's not to say that he doesn't kill people in this season because, of course, he does. Homelander probably doesn't go a single day without somebody by accident. So there's plenty of scenes of him 
just people torturing people like a group of scientists. Uh, I mean, and he has some brutal slaughters, you know, ripping someone's face off and licking his own with their tongue type, like big gruesome things. But that's not what makes him like a scary villain. It's just how great Anthony Starr's performance is coupled with how well written Homelander is. And now he's got the smartest person in the world by his side and it's just really interesting. Even though Homelander like snaps at one point and just goes like full like like Neanderthal brain and it, like temper tantrum see in red and just goes rogue off book no longer following the master plan that's been elaborately laid out in front of him. He's then trying to do it all himself and that is also still <laughs> really good. Homelander's just a really good villain, and he's good in this season too, of course. I could go on further for things I liked about the season, but I want to start getting into the things I didn't like that I feel makes it the weakest of the series so far. So, one of the main things I didn't like about this season was what they did with Starlight. I have never liked the cliche, the trope of, like, super strong characters starting to lose their powers, oh no. Like, I just never like when a character gets nerfed and she's going through that here in a big way. But worse than that, they turned her into kind of this loose cannon. So, like, she's very aggressive and she seems very callous. So, another thing I really didn't like is that it seems like the relationship between Starlight and Huey is non-existent throughout season four. Like, they probably only have, like, four or five scenes in total where they seem even remotely intimate, and that's in the last couple episodes mainly. But before that, they kind of just look like strangers. They look really indifferent and distant between each other, so that relationship seems sidelined. And for some inexplicable reason, she's very unsympathetic to Huey in even his most traumatic moments, like when he gets multiple times. She actually even gets mad at him for being... So this is going to be a big spoiler, fair... There's a shapeshifter in this season, and the shapeshifter takes the form of Starlight and imprisons the real Starlight. Huey, of course, doesn't know that, so the Annie that keeps coming home to him every night he believes is the real Annie. He'd have no reason to suspect otherwise. So, they they steam ham in the bedroom together. Uh, even propose. They even, you know, have a proposal moment. And when the real Starlight breaks free and, you know, sorts all that mess out, she gets mad at Huey for having with the fake Starlight. He got, he didn't know. He had no idea that this was a stranger. That's just, and she's getting like furious at him for it. That's baffling to me. Because she's also the victim of the show. And yet here, she's mad at Huey for being a victim. That, that really just rubbed me the wrong way. Now, she doesn't stay mad about it for long. A few scenes later, she does come up to Huey and talk about it in a different way. But even still, just having that at all was just really weird for Starlight as a character. I, I just really didn't like what they did with Starlight for this season. But with the way the finale ends, I am very curious to see what she's like in season 5. Because the position she's in at the end of this season is totally different. Another thing that really started grinding my gears, and this one's a little more of a nitpick, but it really felt like this season, half of the characters were just perpetually... Like, of course that's nothing new to the boys. This isn't going to be like one of those moments where your eyes pop out of your skull like, And the boys? Why, I never. But even in previous seasons with like the hero-gasm and everything, this one just felt like every character conversation somehow tied into cock in one way or another like any time the deep or noir was on screen they would talk about having a boner so like the deep is talking noir like yeah no like super cool you get called like a boner and stuff you, you know he fills with blood and it gets big from people and then he gets a erection later and then ashley's constantly stepping on scrotums and then it has that huey scene with one of the soups who's like masturbating while telling him to sit on a cake and then getting tickled and it's just like, it's just so much and like half of the dialogue sometimes when it feels like a character doesn't exactly know what to say they immediately default to saying like time to make like my butt cheeks and come and then break like they break the huddle and then go go do whatever they were about to do i don't know i just like for the for the millionth time that they said like that i just got real tired of hearing it it was so frequent like, so much. And then another thing that I'm kind of indifferent on is Butcher. I love Butcher as a character. But in this season, there was... I'm going to avoid some spoilers around Butcher here, but there were some things with Butcher and, of course, what's happening to him 
that led to him making some decisions that were really very kind of out of character. But I guess it can make sense given what he's going through right now. And overall, I still think he was good in the season. It's just there were some times where I really felt like he would do things just for the sake of, like, convenience to the plot. I don't know how to really talk around it without getting into the specifics, but overall, I still thought Butcher was great, but with a couple of hiccups that I wasn't too big of a fan of. Some of my other complaints, I think, are a little too specific and spoilery, and I'm trying not to, like, spoil big stuff, though I guess I kind of already vaguely did with one of the things I talked about, but even still, uh, overall, I did enjoy it. I still really like the boys. I still think this is a good show and a good season. It's just not as strong as the previous three, in my opinion. But it's not like it's significantly worse or anything either. And I really did like the season finale a lot. This is like the first season finale where things are in a completely different spot than where they began. A lot of the other ones have kind of gone back to status quo. Not this. Not at all. So I'm very excited for the final season. Plugging season four of the boys in the moist meter, I'd give it a very comfortable, like, 75%. So yeah, that's really about it. See ya. What the f*** going on, Sonic fans? Let's take a break from to Sonic and Knuckles fanfic porn and check out the new Sonic the Hedgehog trailer. I'm wet and ready to look at this bad boy. And we all know it's going to be absolutely awful. We've seen what Sonic looks like. He looks like a degenerate in a fursuit. But let's check out this trailer and see if they improved anything. Uh, in case they haven't, I've got a plate of peppers here, and I will eat one for every bad moment in the trailer. I'm going to be honest, I only know the name of one of these. This is known as a jalapeno. It's a very, very spicy pepper, said to be over 1 million scoville on a bad day. So I'm really hoping this trailer doesn't go fast and blow some fat, stinky ass, because I don't want to really destroy myself. I'm going to be honest, I've been slacking on my spicy pepper training, so I'm a huge when it comes to this, and you all know that. I also have this pepper... And this pepper here, and I don't know what these are called. For all I know, these could be Franken peppers born in a secret laboratory by Dexter from Dexter's Lab. Crossbreeding a Carolina Reaper and a ghost pepper together, mix it with some gasoline and lava. It could be deadly. Let's check out this trailer and uh, hope for the best. That's already a bite. It's a stupid idea to make a live action Sonic. I immediately dropped my pepper. Is that Dr. Manhattan's pubic hair? That's super cute. Sega hasn't made a game in 20 years. That's another bite. That's a f that's a big bite. Good song choice. Very fitting. Is that the truck they transported the juggernaut in in X-Men? You're not suggesting who I think you're suggesting. Oh. We have no choice. Oh, it's such a bad costume. He looks like a school shooter. <laughs> Are you in charge here? Yes, I am. No. My I'm wrong. God, jalapenos are hot. Allow me to clarify. <sighs> sequentially ranked hierarchy based on level of critical importance. The disparity between... He's become a Redditor. Agent Stone. The doctor thinks you're based Oh, that was the worst line I've heard in a long time. I'm sorry, Major. What was your name? Benny. Nobody cares. Uh, uh. Oh, it's such a bad costume. Meow. It's such a bad line. Oh, come on. Okay, pal. Basically, it looks like I'm going to have to save your planet. Save your planet? Is he an alien? Oh my god, what are these pep- Oh, is that uh, No, but they're uh, the, rascal. They're hiding it. They're hiding it so bad. Whatever this creature is, our job is to secure it, neutralize it, see what makes it tick. God, what is the budget? It's like less than a YouTube video. I owe so many bites. 
But I'm really short on breath. Oh, God. That doesn't look horrible. Can't, can't wait for the movie.